Um, can I just invite all the uh, speakers we've had so far, if, if you could uh, switch your cameras back on them, and we'll go into the panel discussion. And I echo what Chris says, any questions, please, please put them in the box. I've got one to, to kick us off uh, once we've got the panel on board. Lovely. Excellent. So I just wanted to start with uh, a general question. So how, how do our current processes in, uh, how do our, in this country, processes in evaluating sudden ki cardiac death compare to uh, other developed countries? Is, is that for me? Uh, please, yes. Um, well, you've already heard Mary compare what's going on in the States and Australasia uh, to what we're doing here. So. There's a very well developed service and program in Australia and New Zealand, partly um, uh, initiated through a research program. Um, but they, they've they really managed to to make a coherent um, uh, approach uh, to to managing families from the uh, presentation to the coronal services there. And they do have a very similar coronal structure to us, um, given the our, um, uh, our close relationship in the Commonwealth. Um, they are obviously smaller countries than us, and I know New Zealand has been most, most successful in delivering that. Um, so I think they're a great model to follow. Um, and a lot of what we're doing is very similar uh, to them, but clearly uh, across a, a, a slightly larger uh, population base. The, um, the American system is probably the, the, the worst system in the, um, in, in the uh, developed world because of the the different states, the different processes, the different medical examiners, the different coroners. It's a, it's a complete mess of different approaches and lack of any uh, federal coordination. Uh, and they've been making efforts by setting up a large um, and reasonably well-funded NIH research program to try and develop, deliver that, but I, I, it's not been particularly effective so, so far. And I see un unless they have a federal program, then I think it's going to really struggle there um, to deliver it. In Europe, they're hamstrung by the fact that there is no autopsy done in many countries. Um, and that really makes it impossible to decide if you have a sudden death due to a genetic heart condition, um, if you don't have an autopsy done, never mind a cardiac, cardiovascular specialist autopsy. So most of Europe is really troubled by that issue. Germany, France in particular. Denmark have recently managed to get that into law for the under for up to 50 years old. Uh, uh, out of hospital sudden deaths. They've actually legislated for that because of, but again, it's a small country where that can be delivered. But I think that's where we could potentially focus some efforts and some of the outcomes of our work is, uh, despite Brexit, is to, is to collaborate with our European colleagues to help um, progress that work. And that's actually something that we could do through the ESC. It's one of the objectives of the European Heart Limb Association ECGen group. And within, and within the UK, UK. And maybe this is to Professor Shepherd, do you often get asked for second opinions, for instance, where maybe a local pathologist has evaluated a young person after a sudden unexpected death, uh, and maybe they're not entirely sure, maybe histology wasn't performed, um, and maybe the family or the cardiologist locally are concerned about the underlying cause? Uh, thanks very much, Chris. It's a good point. Most of the cases I get, will be sent by the pathologist, right? But I do get a percentage that will be sent after the case. So 10% of our second referrals in which I will review the histology, hopefully. And in those cases, yes, you still have misdiagnosis or over or under diagnosis, which we've published on, particularly in the cardiomyopathies, particularly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's either missed or it's overdiagnosed. So that is why the guidelines that we're developing nationally and internationally are going to be very important. And also in the different regions, I think, as Elijah, we get together with the pathologists and establish criteria. I think that's very important. In other words, each case should be reviewed by two pathologists. That's my opinion. A pathologist should never act on their own and make a diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, particularly of the cardiomyopathies, I think. There should always be a second opinion because it's so important for the cardiologist and for the family. We've 10 percent of our cases are misdiagnosed on average, either under or over cold. So I think there's room for training of pathologists in the diff because they're rare entities. So pathologists do not meet them every day. There's also an overdiagnosis of coronary artery disease. 
the cutting off of this and this. Um, do you sometimes do you need to perform special tests or stains on cardiac tissue specimens to help with diagnosis? Chris, it's still pretty old fashioned. No, there's no magic test for arrhythmogenic or hypertrophic or dilated. It's simply hematoxylinate and good old fashioned, very basic investigations. I think in the future we'll have markers for the individual entities and subtypes, let's say, of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. But at the moment, there is no great markers that we can use. It's simply good old fashioned histology. But in the future, hopefully biomarkers, uh, informatics, I think I look forward to getting new developments because it would be useful for pathologists and make their life easier in the future. What's important for us pathologists is to feed into e-cardiologists so the feedback come back to us on the families and on the genetic testing so we can correlate with you and refine our diagnostic criteria. And I think this will be throughout the whole of the United Kingdom that we can then with the Danish group, as Elijah says, and also with the Australians, put out criteria that are phenotypically and genotypically correlating and make it easier for us pathologists. Thank you. Um, we do have one more pathological question before a couple of specific questions relating to the previous talks. The pathological question was just in the chat. Um, somebody's asked if you have any cases where there may be ambiguity um, around congenital versus inherited forms of heart disease. I assume the diagnosis at post-mortem, uh, particularly when it comes to an unexpected death in a young person. Now we have a good question about congenital heart disease because some 3% of our sudden deaths are in people with congenital heart disease and it's not due to cardiac failure. These people have been well, you know, looked after in specialist centres. They're all their parameters and their function is good and yet they die suddenly. And it, it's arrhythmogenic, we're presuming, due to their previous entities, but Others obviously are cardiac failure, etc. But there is a small percentage where they've been well controlled and looked after, and there's an incidence of sudden death. But you're not worried about it being acquired. But could there be an underlying channelopathy? It's a good question. When the surgery, etc., has been well done and they've lived into their thirties and forties, a very challenging area. And what we get here is the complex congenital cases, you know, the transpositions with complex surgery. So we often attribute the death to the fibrosis and the ventricle due to the surgery, even though they may not have had a history of arrhythmia in the past. Thank you. Lovely. We've got a number of questions coming through the uh, panel, uh, the, the chat now, which is excellent. Um, one that we were going to ask as well um, that I will direct initially at, at Michael, if that's OK. Um, how does uh, the question specifically says 12 lead halter monitoring, but I suppose we could widen that to say halter monitoring in general feature in your current practice uh, with patients with uh, inherited arrhythmic conditions? Thank you. Thank you, Liam, and I'd be interested in my, my colleague's answer to this question as well. It's only relatively recently that we've had the opportunity for 12 lead halter monitoring. Um, my main um, uh, utility of that within inherited arrhythmia syndromes at the moment is, is for patients referred with suspected Brugada syndrome. Um, and a number of patients that I see when I discuss um, sodium channel blockade testing, asmaline testing, and uh, particularly discussing the very small but tangible risks of the test, patients often ask what the alternative is. And one of the alternatives, of course, is to do a more prolonged period of monitoring. Um, so I've done a number of, of 12 lead halters with, with high ventricular leads looking for type 1 changes. I do have to say, in my experience, that's been relatively disappointing. Um, and I'm not sure I can think of anywhere there's been a clear type one change and it's usually just been a, a temporizing measure until the patients have time to think whether or not they like to attend um, attend for um, asmaline testing. Um, I haven't used uh, 12 lead halter monitoring in patients with Brugada syndrome as a way of monitoring because um, I'm not certain what the value is in terms of how much prognostic uh, information it adds. Alter monitoring for patients with Brugada. We have a policy of generally uh, carrying these out once a year. Again, although again, I'm not certain what the value of that is in terms of the pickup rates. 
in the absence of symptoms, and it may be something that we should audit. But clearly, monitoring is, will also be symptom driven, whether it's halter monitoring or implantation of a loop recorder. Um, I'll stop at that point, and I see Elijah's got his hands up, hand up, so I'll be very interested to hear what he thinks in, in that respect. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we've been using 12 lead halters for a little while. Um, in fact, I think we started using them back in 2003 under the influence of my late colleague, Dr. Veloslav Bachkarov, who was an amazing ECG scientist and, um, uh, and a great visionary when it came to the use of dig digital ECG data and said to me, Elijah, stop using paper. Use use digital ECG data, and why don't we think about looking in the heart a bit differently? So he, I think he was the main impetus for for us starting that, um, and uh, and we started doing it really systematically in 2007 onwards, and uh, we we use it as you do um, for in the high lead um, configuration, so all six leads in the anterior precordium, like you showed on your um, on the diagram during your talk uh, and use, look for dynamic changes. Um, in our SADS group uh, that we reported, um, uh, we had around, I think just under 200 relatives diagnosed with regard to on the basis of Ashmolene testing and the um, and about 10% of those from subsequent 12 lead halter monitoring showed uh, potentially diagnostic changes um, or also um, maybe worrying changes, either polymorphic VT um, or uh, dynamic type one patterns on their on their halters. And some work from Australia um, uh, has suggested that a burden of um, type one may be directly related to outcomes. Um, but certainly I, I treat them as a spontaneous type one if they've got a spontaneous type one in their 12 lead halter. You've just been unlucky at missing it in the clinic if it's been there, um, if it's there at other times. Um, so that's how we use it. The other thing is to look for VEs, um, localization of VEs for ablation. Yeah, just to add that we have a similar approach. So in those patients diagnosed after sodium channel blockade, we use our halter as a screening test to see if they've got a spontaneous type one. Uh, and if they don't, you know, we, we reassure them that they remain in that low risk category. Um, I think there are potentially future applications. Uh, I know Elijah and I have talked about this, but using machine learning approaches to look for additional diagnostic and potentially prognostic information from that prolonged monitoring. Um, 24 hours is still only a very short snapshot. And if, if there's a, another way of a more wearable ECG for longer monitoring, I think that's something to look forward for in the future. Um, but I'm, I'm sure there's much more information in the ECG if we can uh, get hold of it and uh, and interrogate it properly. Thank you very much. Very, very uh, interesting question. Thank you for that. I've got another question uh, which I will uh, uh, fire at Michael again initially, but it will open up a debate across the panel, I'm sure. Um, someone has asked that with the maximum dose uh, of 100 uh, kilograms, uh, 100 milligrams for adjuvant for patients up to 100 kilograms, is there a risk that we are under diagnosing regard? And uh, would you still list patients if they weigh over 100 kilograms? And then I've got a follow up question which has asked about whether what's the reference for, for the maximum dose of 100 uh, and whether actually there's a higher maximum dose. Thank you, a good question. And again, Elijah, no doubt will be more knowledgeable about this than, than I am. Um, yes, I would um, uh, undertake an asthmaline test in someone over 100 kilograms in weight, although the maximum dose I would give is, is 100 milligrams. Um, is there a potential for uh, missing a de missing a condition of regard? I guess the answer to that question is yes. My concern is more the the risk of of uh, inappropriately diagnosing it and over diagnosing it. Um, if you were potentially to miss a diagnosis because you gave 100 milligrams rather than 120, I think it's such a powerful drug that if you fail to provoke a type one change with 100 milligrams of ashmaline. Then even if you potentially missed missed the diagnosis, you one would think that the risk would be very low because you can't uh, induce the ECG change despite quite powerful sodium channel blockade. So um, although I guess there's a there's a potential downside there, um, I I would be comfortable in labelling that patient as low risk for Brigada and, and certainly low risk. Uh, 
Um, I can't cite the reference where the 100 milligram limit comes from, I'm afraid. Elijah may, may well be able to. Thank you. Um, is, that, is that a cue for me? <laughs> yes, please. Are we, are we about to finish? Um, We've got some time. I, I think Rolf et al uh, was one that specified that, that limit, but there, there are about two or three different protocols. Um, and one milligram per kilogram over five minutes, 100 milligram maximum is what we set on. We used to do more than that, uh, but started to think, um, I mean, this is going back a while. Um, my first test was in 1999, and so that's going back away. Um, and the um, the benefit of doing Ashmolean testing has rendered me less and less enthusiastic over the years. Um, and uh, uh, while we still offer it systematically, to, particularly to our SANS family members, that's only after going through a very rigorous process of exclusion of other causes uh, and explanation that a negative test, Ashmolean test, while it may exclude Ashmolean, does run the risk of a positive test. Um, and a positive test um, may still indicate that there's a bit of risk there, but it's incredibly small, but render the brigada phobic for the rest of their lives. So it's uh, it's a real it's a bit of a it's a bit of a challenge, and um, I think if you've got a 150 kilogram patient who gets 100 milligrams of adrenaline and doesn't have any changes, I wouldn't give them any more for the sake of it. Um, I completely concur with what Mike said. Very sensible approach to managing adrenaline. Um, it's a really powerful non-physiological uh, approach um, to uh, to inducing what we hope is a, a physiological substrate to appear. And so you've got to really think how, uh, how hard you have to try to get it to, to, to come out. And the harder you're trying, the less likely it is to be relevant. In the Amsterdam group also, oh, sorry. Um, the Amsterdam group showed that when you approach that one milligram per kilo threshold, that's when you start getting diagnoses that um, maybe don't fit with the family. So they published, I think it's about 700 cases of sun unexplained death and asthma testing. And found that those diagnoses made at the top end of the of the scale, um, other alternative diagnoses were made in the same family. Again, suggesting that it was potentially a false positive. Thank you. Yeah. The interesting thing about them is that they were giving two milligrams per kilogram when they when they were a bit suspicious, they would go on from one milligram to two milligrams per kilogram. So I think there, that's really a case of trying to find something that isn't there. Mm. I would like to squeeze in just a quick question before we take a short break, if that's all right. I'm hoping for a succinct answer. Um, this is a question that's been posed by one of the attendees, which I think is a good question. Uh, moving from a pilot supported by the BHF to an embedded NHS service implies a significant amount of resources. In light of the current economic crisis, what priority has NHS England given to sudden cardiac death workup? And for how many years has the funding being secured. You wanted a succinct answer. <laughs> OK, then you shouldn't have invited me to speak today. Um, so, yeah, the, the GMSAs have got money probably for about a year and a half to support the programme. And then it's it's going to be embedded in the ICC service specifications. Um, so that, therefore, it's going to have to be funded through uh, commissioning and through trusts uh, be willing to invest in their services to fit the service specifications. So the answer is we'll find out because nobody's actually promised the money, just as they, um, the, the only promise so far has just been for the current uh, five year, 10 year plan. Tell me, Elijah, so five, 10 year plan, but you said only for a year and a half you've got genetic testing. I was talking about the clinical services. The genetic testing is part of the eligibility criteria for um, for post-mortem gene testing. So in theory, they're covered by centralised NHS England funding for ad infinitum. Right, but and pathology <laughs> services are not going to be covered at all. The, the Royal Patholo College of Pathologists are discouraged, don't want anything to do with it, or the trusts. No, no well, I think I think we've got the support of the Royal College of Pathology um, for the pilot uh, and for instituting um, for instituting uh, commissioning of pathology services through the ICC service specifications. 
So that's where the money will have to come, and then they will. There, there, is, there is a will there for designation of potentially two to three specialist centres in the UK for cardiac pathology. I think being realistic, I think that's probably what 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 will be most achievable. Um, more than that, there aren't there, there aren't the resources to justify it. Less than that, and it runs great risks of being lost. Absolutely, I think that would be what the future plan is from pathology point of view. Thank you very much um, to all of the panelists actually for some great talks in the first session. Uh, so thank you. And I think we'll take a short break for 10 minutes, um, give you time to pop out. And then uh, we kick things off for the second session with uh, Professor Bear, who will be returning to talk to us about um, Brugada syndrome. So we very much look forward to that. And thank you everyone for joining us.